in the world at engineering. Well, the British invented the steam engine, the internal combustion engine, the propeller, the jet engine, the train, the hovercraft, the cast iron, iron bridges, the suspension bridge, lawnmowers, umbrellas and cat's eyes. Our enthusiastic experts have pointed me towards their favourite engineering icons, which they think reflect the best of British. When it comes to planes, what a fantastic list we've got for you. <laughs> I learn how to fly without a plane. How not to fly without a plane. Oh, I crashed yet. And I finally get to throttle the crew. Wow, well, thank God we've got the handbrake on. As anyone who knows anything will tell you, the father of modern flight was British, George Cayley, who invented the glider way back in 1853. The early history of flight, of course, was rather checkered, and for all the sop with camels and such stuff, our experts have skipped the preliminaries. They've gone straight for a plane which, its admirers claim, altered the course of history. If some idiot tells you that engineering lacks romance or heroism, then you must twiddle your moustache, laugh at them scornfully and direct their attention to one of the most important aeroplanes ever built. There are very few pieces of engineering which are so familiar, so beloved, so guaranteed to bring a lump to the throat as the magnificently named Spitfire. Today is a special day. It's exactly 70 years since the very first Spitfire, affectionately known as K5054, took its maiden flight. clearly means so much to people. Hundreds have turned up just to stand here in the car park at Southampton Airport to watch. The British love this plane for good reason. We owe the engineers who built the Spitfire and the brave pilots who flew her an incalculable debt, for they played no small part in keeping Britain free from Nazi tyranny. The plane itself, I am told, is a genuinely brilliant bit of aeronautic engineering, which still captivates pilots like squadron leader Charlie Brown. Well, the Spitfire is the ultimate carefree handling aeroplane. It's got performance, but at the same time, generally you pay a price for performance, which is sort of maybe finicky handling at the margins. Spitfire, no, I promise you, it is absolutely carefree. So what made the Spitfire so fast and agile? She was designed by RJ Mitchell, a young British engineer who had recently won the coveted Schneider Trophy, with a seaplane that reached a record-breaking 341 miles per hour. But when he was asked to design a world-beating plane for the Royal Air Force, Mitchell knew there was more than a trophy at stake. Mitchell understood that if the British were to stand a chance in the looming war with Germany, they had to dominate the skies. And so he designed for the RAF a fighter which was at the cutting edge of aviation technology. His single-shell alloy fuselage made the plane strong and light, and her distinctive elegant wings made her incredibly manoeuvrable. The novel wing shape was especially hard to mass produce, but it put the Spitfire in an aerodynamic class of its own. The Messerschmitt 109 was the German answer to Mitchell's plane. It has flat, oblong wings which just look stuck onto the body of the plane. Rubbish. Now compare the elegant wings of the Spitfire. They're not small, they're big enough to accommodate retractable wheels and heavy guns. But they are delicately moulded, seeming to grow organically out of the fuselage. They rise gracefully at an angle from the body of the plane, in outline they look like a nicely rounded half moon, and they're tapered to be thinner at the tips. This created the famous elliptical shape, and this was the key to the Spitfire's success. It meant that the angle of airflow over the wing of the fuselage was greater than at the tip. This gave the pilot plenty of warning of a stall. The plane would start to talk to the pilot through feedback to the controls. Basically, the stick started shaking. And in combat, the Spitfire had to be kept very close to the edge of stalling to achieve the minimum turning circle. The wings made the Spitfire infinitely more agile than the Messerschmitt. What made it faster was the most famous aviation engine of the war, the legendary 12-cylinder, 27-litre Rolls-Royce Merlin, which Sir Henry Royce based on that of Mitchell's Schneider seaplane. 
The Merlin enabled the Spitfire to fly fast and carry more guns and ammunition and still be highly maneuverable with a steep rate of climb and a tight turning circle. It was the perfect plane. One of the original test pilots, Alex Henshaw, is today celebrating the anniversary of the first Spitfire's maiden flight. He says he's still in love with her, even though he's 93 and she's only 70. When you first flew on, did you think this is something special? This is out of the ordinary? Oh, yes. Mm. Yes, not only just for performance, but for handling qualities, mm. not only in the air, but uh, for landing. I mean, mm. th there isn't an easier aircraft in the world to land this. Is that far. right? Mm. What do you think gave it the edge over its German equivalent? Oh, no question about it. Uh, the uh, new concept of construction and the design, which gave it uh, a performance of certain mm. altitudes, uh, weights and angles of attack and mm. what have you, over and above the 109. The 109 was a good aircraft, but it did have a lot of yeah. weaknesses. Mm -hmm. Gordon Mitchell remembers the day his father brought him to the Southampton airfield to see his new fighter plane. Actually, it looked a bit of a mess. Really? Because it had come out of the factory right. unpainted. So it, it had, had bits no... of yellow, yeah. bits of green, mm -hmm. and I thought to myself, it would look a jolly sight better if it had a good coat of paint. But could you say it was not just any ordinary aeroplane? Oh, ordinary? yes, I think I did. Yeah. I asked my father, I remember, something like, are you happy with it? Yeah. He didn't say much to start with, and then said, yes, reasonably so. By the time Britain declared war in 1939, the RAF had on order more than 2,000 of the new fighters. Sadly, R.J. Mitchell never knew what an enormous difference his plane was to make. In June 1937, two years before war was declared, Mitchell died of cancer, aged just 42. In the Battle of Britain, the Spitfires and their pilots brought down 529 German fighter planes and bombers. It's impossible to measure how far the Spitfire and the pilots that flew her changed history. But the famous assessment of Churchill is a fittingly grateful and poetic memorial. Never in the field of human conflict was so much owed by so many to so few. The jet age was more or less designed by God to make small boys happy. It was the Jetsons and Roger Ramjet and men in silver suits with shoulder pads climbing into rocket planes. It was super sexy and exhilarating and futuristic. Something of a surprise then that it all started in Coventry. Strange but true. It may have ended with Buck Rogers in a Lycra jumpsuit, but it started with a pipe smoking bloke in a cardigan living in the Midlands. His name was Frank Whittle. As early as 1929, Frank Whittle had dreamt up a way of making propellers more efficient. The propeller, another British invention, acted like a windmill in reverse, pulling the plane through the air. It occurred to Whittle that if you encased the propeller, you would suck air into the engine itself. The air would then combust and explode out of the exhaust with enormous force, pushing the plane through the air at an extraordinary speed. Frank Whittle had invented the jet engine. Fighter Command, now armed with something keener and swifter and more deadly to its foes than anything the last war ever saw. This beauty is the prototype of the first ever jet plane, the Gloucester Meteor, the plane I'm going to be flying a little later. But before that, I'm going to meet one of the world's first jet pilots, who happens to be Frank Whittle's son. Ian. Hi, Rory. Nice to meet you. Hello. And this is a schoolboy dream for me, a Gloucester Meteor. Yes, indeed. The jet that oh, flew so fast. That's right. The it, first. That, well, it, it was, yes, in 1946. Uh, 1945, they had a Meteor 3, got the world speed record at 606 miles an hour, yeah. I think, but I'm not sure. This one at 616 miles yeah. an hour, not bad. This actual aircraft? Yes. This is the, the record right. holder, fantastic. Um, Group Captain Donaldson. Now, you've flown Meteors, haven't you? Yes, I have. Can you tell us what they're like? Very quiet from the pilot's point of view. Um, very noisy for people outside yeah. the aeroplane. Who cares? <laughs> yeah. Do you get a great feeling of power, though? A great feeling of thrust? And more no, thrust? not really, because the, the, the aeroplane, the engines, in those days, the engines wound up quite slowly, so you didn't get a big punch to 
like you did with right. the piston engine, which was oh, straight right. off. That's interesting. So this thing was relatively slow, but once the faster it got, the better it got, you see, as it got more ram air down the intake mm -hmm. of the engine. Can you remember how the public received the idea of the propellerless plane? Yes, uh, it became public in January 1944 and uh, we were suddenly invaded by the press and reporters and things like that. I was only a little boy, and uh, so I'd show them my railway train or whatever <laughs> it was, and then, uh, well, so there was a lot of publicity, which came as a terrific surprise, because up to that point it had been strictly hush-hush, yeah. as we used to say. And Mother wasn't supposed to know about it, although I think she did, and uh, I, as a little boy, didn't realise just knew my dad was very busy with something or other to do with engines that's all really was your father surprised at the publicity that's oh that's yes he was he, yes he was he hated it uh, yes it was horrible for him yeah. why don't we go and have a look at the engine you can explain it to me because I've never understood how, <laughs> how your engine works I don't believe you I bet you do <laughs> correct me if I'm wrong air is sucked in it's compressed it's blown out with fuel which is ignited and well, uh, yes, the ignition happens a bit before that, but yes, you, you got it right. It, it's, the air is compressed into the combustion chambers right. there, and of course it expands enormously with the heat, hence your jet propulsion. I confess that I am a complete 100% fully paid up boy, and the idea of jets makes me wobble at the knees with excitement. And today, I'm going to fly in Whittle's jet plane, the first in the world, the Gloucester Meteor. For insurance purposes, I'm having to go up with someone who actually knows how to fly. Daredevil test pilot, Mad Dan Griffiths. Goodbye. I mean, au revoir. Alpha and Alpha for two, three, Alpha nine. Sitting here, looking at all this metal, it looks like a proper, proper grown-up aeroplane. Proper war machine, doesn't it? Yeah, a war machine, that's right. 22, that's actuated Alpha and Charlie, Kin H1014. Oh, I love it when girls talk like that. Vehicle which one's going to come in? It is so different, isn't it, from being in a big jet airliner, which will probably be going much faster at takeoff than this. Here we go. a better plane than you. The funny thing about the earliest jets is that they don't shoot off like a bat out of hell, they start slow and get faster and faster and faster. I'm, I'm not complaining about this, Dan, but everything feels comfortable. That's the speed. We're not going at the frightening speed. No. Looking back, I wish I hadn't said that. Yeah, you expect there'll be some fancy equipment to tell you where you are. But in the Meteor, the pilot has to steer with his knees while he wrestles with an out-of-date AA map. After passing over Newport Pagnell for the fifth time, Dan asks a cab driver and we finally make it back to base. Frank Whittle built his jet for the RAF, but it changed all our lives, thanks to what economists like to call the post-war boom. The Consumer Society, much sniffed at these days, brought the benefits of new technology to ordinary people for the first time. It also broadened our horizons. Never mind the annual jaunt to Whitley Bay, which never looked like that, by the way. How about going abroad? Before the war, flying had been strictly for the super-rich. But one glamorous, sexy, wonderful plane changed all that the world's first passenger jet liner. The Comet 
comet rocketed Britain to rows 1 to 8 of the international jet set. It was the first passenger carrying jet aircraft, the first to fly the Atlantic, the first to fly at high altitude way above the clouds and the first to exceed 500 miles an hour. The comet was simply the most glamorous plane ever built and today I'm meeting one of the men who flew her, Captain Bryn Waite. Captain Bryn Waite. I recognize you. I'd like Hi, to introduce Rory. you to a Dana Comet 4B. It's my girlfriend. You've actually met before, haven't you? We have, yeah. I nearly married her 27 years ago. 27 years ago, since you saw this plane. Absolutely. So I came up here to have another look at her and just say I still love her. And can I just uh, confess, well, yes. or, or, or own up to the fact, yep. the Dana Comet was the first plane I ever flew on. Is that right? Yeah. Oh, well, there to you Madrid go. on a school trip, and very educational it was too, but we won't go into that. Gas at Madrid. When I flew, I was very excited to be flying on a jet, my very first. Sure. And it is an incredible feeling that that feeling when you get when the aircraft accelerates as it takes off, yeah. and you feel the, feel the seat pushing against Absolutely. your back. It's incredible. Yeah. But what was it like as, as a pilot of it? Well, this machine is basically overpowered. Mm. It's overpowered for its use, mm. and it can go far faster and higher than we used it in yeah. service. Was there a feeling in the general public that this was a fantastic plane to be on when it first came out? The Comet 1, when it came out, it was the, the equivalent of the Space Shuttle. It was new, high-tech stuff. They were doing things nobody had ever done before, flying pressurised cabin up 40,000 feet. When you're in a jet, you flew above all the weather, basically. Yeah. And it became very smooth. To make a passenger jet commercially viable, it had to be big. But big planes need big engines, and the new jet engines used to drink fuel like George Best. A passenger plane also had to fly smoothly. Fortunately, the new jet engines could fly in much lower temperatures, and therefore could be used at much higher altitudes, leaving the bumpy, bad weather far below. The trouble is, when you fly high, you have to pressurise the cabin to stop the plane imploding. These problems tax the Hertfordshire-based engineering team to the limits. One of the engineers was Mike Ramsden. The great challenge really was, was not only doubling the speed with all the aerodynamic uh, developments that that required, but doubling the height. Right. We had to design an aeroplane to fly at 500 miles an hour at 40,000 feet. Right. And the engineering uh, challenge was absolutely enormous. You'll be interested to know the engineers hit upon a great way to lose weight. They built the fuselage of the Comet in thin gauge aluminium and instead of rivets, the metal sheets were bonded together with glue. To minimise drag, they designed the most graceful thing imaginable. The sleek Comet revolutionised how we think planes should look and of course was famous for the wonderful way its engines were embedded elegantly in the wings. Then they worked out how to pressurise the cabin and as a neat finishing touch, instead of traditional ocean liner style portholes, they fitted large square windows to improve the view. The first Comet was built in 1949 and three years later made its first commercial flight from London to Johannesburg. The Comet, the world's first passenger jet plane, was a sensation. Within months, de Havilland received orders for another 50 planes. Within a year, 30,000 people had travelled on a comet. A new, glamorous, wonderful era had begun. The comet had made the world a smaller, more exciting place. But then disaster. In October 1952, a comet crashed on takeoff in Rome. Over the next two years, five more comets crashed. In 1954, the plane was grounded. Intensive testing began and the fault was found. In order to make the big square windows more secure, they had been riveted as well as glued. Ironically, it was this extra safety measure which had caused the problem. The pressurised cabin put huge stress on the windows, but the rivet holes had weakened the metal around the frame. Innovation always has and always will entail risk. The engineers who designed the Comet were working on the frontiers of aeronautical understanding, and they paid the price. And that's the famous, famous window. This is was, where the fatigue cracks started. This is where the fatigue cracks began. So what's, how, does that, how does that happen then? We're talking about what stresses is it subjected to? Well, if you can imagine, the, the pressure inside here had to be three times greater than the conventional pressure in propeller airliners. 
I mean, the load on that area there would be about a ton. The riveting was too close to the edge. Um, that was not a good idea. De Havilland released the findings to the rest of the aviation industry to ensure no one else would make the same mistake. Then they built a new comet. A stronger fuselage, four powerful new Rolls-Royce engines and good old reliable oval windows. The new Comet 4 was launched in 1958 to the acclaim of aviation engineers and that year became the first commercial passenger jet to fly the Atlantic. But it was too late. Just one airline kept faith with the Comet, Dan Air. But thanks to them, a generation of travellers, including me, were introduced to the wonder of jet travel. I am now entering the world of Top Gun. A world of crazy young daredevil fighter pilots called things like Maverick and Ice Cool. Except this is RAF Wittering, so the pilots are rather more sensible and called things like Peter and Giles. But the planes, which are British, are the best of the best. Some think they're better than the best of the best. The Harry has everything a good jet fighter needs. Speed, agility, firepower. But the Harrier gives you something else besides. When you're flying a thing, if you get a bit bored with whizzing around at high speed, you can just stop in mid-air and have a rest. Put the kettle on, read the paper and wait for the next dogfight. It's an amazing sight. A fighter jet built for speed, just hanging there magically in mid-air, looking like it ran out of petrol just before landing. But apart from giving Maverick a well-earned 40 winks, why did they build the Harrier jump jet? During the Second World War, military strategists learned that large airfields with long runways were very vulnerable to conventional attack. What they needed was an aircraft that could take off and land in confined spaces. This aircraft was their solution. Time to meet Mad Dog Maverick himself, or Christopher Roy Rogers, as he prefers to be known. It's an incredible plane. Chris, what's it like to fly? Uh, it's a very dynamic yeah. aircraft to fly. It's mm -hmm. a big, heavy aeroplane. The one you're looking at at the moment is the two-seater. Mm -hmm. um, I suppose in comparison to the Hawk, it's equally yeah. agile, yeah. Um, but the, different, the big difference is the utilisation of the nozzles to slow the aircraft down and fly like a helicopter. Yeah. You mentioned helicopter. Do you have to know how to fly a helicopter to fly one of these things? It helps. Yeah. Um, and indeed, when the chaps leave um, Valley, the Hawk trainer course to come here, we send them to Shawbury to learn from the specialists yeah how to hover, operate at slow speed, um, and which way to move the stick and throttle to cope with the helicopter environment. The Harrier can take off and land vertically. It can hover and maneuver in mid-air. Or if it's being pursued in a dogfight, it can make a very sudden stop mid-flight, forcing its pursuer to fly straight past and into its line of fire. Behind the Harrier is some truly brilliant engineering. So how does it work? Now everyone knows what's unique about this aircraft. It can take off vertically or has short takeoff and landing. How does that work mechanically? Um, in simple layman's terms, if you look that's into the... It. Yeah, simple layman's <laughs> terms. Yeah. If you look into the intake, uh, which this is the intake, the air is channeled through to the engine, one engine, um, which... Now, you, that, that's surprising. It's, I assume there were two engines, one either side, and we're seeing... One enormous engine that generates 20,000 pounds of thrust plus. So if we were standing on the other side of the intake, we'd see the other half of that yeah, fan? Yeah, oh, essentially. Wow. And if you put your hand through there, you could wave, wave that, at the other side. Yeah. <laughs> um, so you're looking at the first stage of the low-pressure compressor. No. Um, and then as we walk down, if we Air walk down... Air is sucked in, yeah. as in a jet engine. It's yeah. then squashed through varying stages yeah. as more and more blades, yeah. tighter, tighter, yeah. squeezed, and then ignited and then high pressure fuel is injected and burnt at uh, extreme temperatures and blasted out the nozzles. The thing that makes the whole aircraft unique is the fact that these nozzles move. Mm -hmm. So with the nozzles pointing back, it's mm -hmm. just like a normal jet engine. Yeah. You know when you go on holiday, you can see the whole engine. Yeah. It's just level, isn't it, pointing That's backwards. Right. We'll say all the thrust from here and move these nozzles. And what I'll do, I'll just gently move them now. Um, 
Now you can see that they all move together. Yeah. So as we, we, we move these nozzles, mm -hmm. it's called vectoring the thrust. Mm -hmm. Okay, because effectively we're just applying a, a different vector. Vectoring the thrust, make a note of that. Add a few more nozzles in the wing tips and the nose to make sure the thing balances, and that's how a Harrier hovers in the air. But it's one thing getting it to hover, it's another thing steering it while it's there. Roy rather meanly said I couldn't have a go myself, but luckily my charming series engineer Claire has discovered a way to demonstrate the principles of steering a hanging Harrier using the biggest hairdryer in the world. It's just like a jet aircraft, isn't it? Just up and down, really steady. He must be really burning the fuel up there. It looks quite intense. <laughs> He's just showing off there. Like Pinocchio, there are strings attached. This chap's having a blast on top of a column of air in a vertical wind tunnel. This is trickier than it looks, as I'm about to discover. But you can see how, with the slightest wiggle of a hand or leg, he's able to change direction. You're going to be a human jump jet. Am I? Yes. Excellent. Do I get yes. to jump? I think you get to, I'm hoping that you're going to get to take off being pushed up from underneath yeah. and then I want to see you zooming around the place. Do you? <laughs> <laughs> changing the directions okay. of your nozzles to right. uh, change the directions of flight just like the jump jet. You've got to sort of do a sort of parachute fall position haven't that, you? That's the, that's the position. Is that right? Yep. Yeah. Okay, on, I'm ready. Off you go. I'm not with him. I love the clown suit. But this, this is a serious demonstration, Rory. How we'll see about that. A jump jet works, okay? okay? So I want to see a perfect lift off, and then I want to see you zooming around inside. Zooming around. Zooming around, so. yeah. Using your deflectors. Using your nozzles. Using your nozzles. Yeah? Okay. Go on, get in there. I can't think of anything you can go wrong. So it's increasing its surface area, so it's pushing up and hovering beautifully. Uh, it's really, in two minutes, it's really going the wrong way. More of a the human jump jet. Did you feel that you became the human jump jet? Sorry? Did you feel that you became the human jump jet? Sorry? Oh, okay, sorry. <laughs> That's better. What are you saying? Do you feel that you, you were the living spirit of the, of the jump jet? Pardon? <laughs> <laughs> no, actually, it, it is very, very difficult. And you do realise that the slightest movement does do a lot. You know, the slightest thing, you know, when someone says, do that, Rory, do that, it's... Uh, yeah. I think you do really well. And you can't it? breathe. Yeah, uh, air rushing up your nose, it's very, very unpleasant. I felt my brain was coming out my ears. Oh, the, the jump jet uses a phenomenal amount of fuel. Did you feel that you've um, burnt off some calories yeah, in Yeah, yes, I wish I'd had more for breakfast now. <laughs> <laughs> and I will go for that piss now. <laughs> <laughs> the principles of how a Harrier works may seem simple enough, but as always with engineering, the devil is in the detail. It took the designer Sir Sidney Cam and a team of engineers led by Sir Stanley Hooker 13 years to work it out. This was the first attempt, built in 1953, nicknamed the Flying Bedstead. Two Rolls-Royce jet engines in a metal frame with the exhaust pointing downwards. But the thing only stayed up for 10 minutes at a time and was almost impossible to steer. And tragically, on its second outing, the Bedstead crashed, killing the test pilot.
A breakthrough came with the development of the Pegasus engine, a jet engine with four swivelling nozzles that could direct thrust from the engine exhaust. The engineers at Hawker Siddeley decided to build an aircraft around this engine and came up with a P-1127. Test flights with the P-1127 began in 1960. Vertical takeoff was fine, but like the bedstead, it was almost impossible to control. So they tethered the hovering plane to the ground. By a painful process of experiment and disappointment, they finally cracked it. By 1966, the first Harrier jump jet, the sexiest jet fighter ever built, was in the air. Even though I've learned how to vector my thrust in Claire's hairdryer, Roy Rogers rather meanly says I still can't have a go in his jump jet. But he says the RAF's wraparound full-screen Harrier simulator reproduces the thing very accurately and is not quite as life-threatening. OK, if you ask him to release you... Please release me. Let me go. I'll put my 50 p in. OK, just going to feel for the stick. So move her gently right. You can see she rolls right, gently left. You can see she rolls left. And you can see the little budgy moves with you. Now, if you pull hard back on the stick, pull on more pull. There you go. And what we'll do is just go full power. Look out to the side. So far, so good. I'm flying in a straight line. But will I be able to slow down and hover? What you can do now is roll hard left. down you push forward okay. just straight forward Ooh. easy left other left <laughs> pull hard pull really hard <laughs> oops <laughs> I crashed yet <laughs> my landing was rather too vertical Rory's first crash <laughs> I blame the nozzles I still can't believe they won't let me have a go on the real thing. The Harrier is an incredible example of British engineering at its best, and it still feels so modern and exciting. It's strange to think that the jump jet first became operational 40 years ago. At the same time as the Harrier was in development, another set of British engineers was working on another revolutionary aeroplane design. There are many examples of British engineering which combine technical genius with superb design, but it's hard to think of anything that more successfully brings together brains and beauty than the world's first supersonic passenger plane. Concorde was the first and only passenger plane to date to fly faster than the speed of sound. She flies! Concorde flies at last! Staggeringly brilliant bit of engineering, a breathtakingly beautiful object. Concorde was a supersonic superstar. Amazing. It's a bit like meeting a celebrity, you know. You meet them for the first time in real life, you've only seen them on television before, and then there they are. Much smaller in real life. It really is quite small. I mean, it's stunning, a stunning shape. Lovely neat curves, but tiny. A bit like Carly Minogue. Today, sadly, it's a tourist attraction. And I'm off to meet my tour guide. This is the last Concorde ever to fly commercially. She now rests peacefully at the place she was born, Airbus in Filton. But she's not forgotten. Every year, thousands of devoted fans who fell under her spell come to visit her. It's the closest most of us ever get to supersonic flight these days, and Andy Chawik is the man in charge. Why do people love it so much? I think it appeals to both sides of the brain. Mm. It's, it That's an amazing answer. I wasn't expecting. <laughs> That's great. Go on. I mean, you've only got to look at her. All the critics of Concorde, when they first saw the craft, were instantly silenced. Yeah. Because she looks right, she is right. But what's special about it from an engineering point of view? I mean, it looks beautiful, but I mean, 
What are the Where gadgets? Where do you start? I mean, crikey, Concorde, everybody says it's another aeroplane, but Concorde was the fly-by-wire aeroplane mm. before the phrase fly-by-wire yeah. was even thought of. So the first aircraft to have a digital computer system as part yeah. of the engine intakes, which was years ahead of the time. Key to Concorde's success was a new kind of jet engine, the Rolls-Royce Olympus 593. These jets were very powerful, the equivalent, I'm told, of 6,000 family cars all going together. But they also had a newly invented secret weapon called reheat. When a Concorde pilot really wants to kick ass, he presses a button and fuel is thrown straight into the engine's hot exhaust gas, giving the plane a sudden violent boost, an additional 25% thrust, pushing it through the sound barrier to a staggering 1,350 miles an hour. Now, I was never lucky enough to fly on Concorde, and I've no idea what it's like to fly supersonically. But in here with me is a guy who piloted Concorde for 10 years, Christopher Oliver. Now, Christopher, I've never been in a cockpit of an aeroplane before, and this is just, oh, just we don't, frightening. We, we, we don't need all these instruments. They're just there to preserve the mystique. Oh, good, Sarah. That's very good news indeed. I mean, there are some things I recognise. The, the joystick, um, yeah. that's for, for turning it round and things like that. These are... Throttles, yeah. Throttles, indeed. Um, and here are the reheat mm. switches. Concorde is unique in having reheated assistance mm. for takeoff and for the acceleration through the speed of sound. Mm. And so when we're ready to go, we've pre selected the reheat, and it's a question of saying three, two, mm. one, now, starting the stopwatch at the same time, full thrust, and away you go. Wow, thank God we've got the handbrake on. Another amazing thing about Concorde is that the famous Delta wings double as petrol tanks and by shifting the distribution of the fuel inside the wings, the pilot can rebalance the plane. Fuel on Concorde is used to balance the trim of the aircraft. Uh, right. As the aircraft flies so fast, the centre of gravity of the aircraft shifts towards the back as right. the aircraft gets lighter. So they can move So they the move fuel the fuel around. inside oh, to see. balance the centre of gravity. Yeah. And again, don't forget, Concorde flies at some 1,350 miles yeah. an hour. So at that speed, although the air temperature at 60,000 feet is about minus 75 degrees, right. this aircraft cooks. Yeah. So the tip of the nose is about mm. 120 degrees. The skin all along the edge of this mm. wing uh, is between 85 and 90 degrees. Mm. So they use the fuel again to cool the skin of the aeroplane. That's amazing. As a heat That's sink. Amazing. You don't have to think of fuel as cooling, do you? No, and the, the last thing they did was throw it in the engine satellite to it. Yeah. <laughs> Supersonic speed created other problems. The engines had trouble compressing air which was coming in faster than 500 miles an hour. But Concorde had to fly faster than this. The engineers at Filton had to come up with a way of slowing down the air intake in less than a third of a second. When we see this danger do not use, yeah. uh, these are a, uh, a set of ramps with inside the intake which effectively cause shock waves within the air. By lowering the ramps it would cause a shock wave to slow the air speed down and also of course heat the air up. Yeah. And because the engine, the design of the engine liked hot air, the design of the intake alone was causing a great deal of increase in power. Yeah. And certainly an increase in the, um, the efficiency of mm. the engine, purely just the intake itself. Clever idea. As with all grand endeavours, there's usually someone around who'll have a moan. Concorde was delivered six years late and 25% over budget. But who cares? It was a silly deadline and an unrealistic budget. In engineering terms, Concorde was a step into the unknown. Problems came from nowhere and solutions didn't come easily. But the engineers who built Concorde, like those who built the Harrier and the Comet, like Sir Frank Whittle and RJ Mitchell, quietly, patiently got on with it. Concorde is a beautiful memorial to the unassuming, pipe-smoking, cardigan-wearing problem solvers who are the real heroes of British engineering. It's just a damn shame she's been grounded. So have we said goodbye to supersonic passenger travel? I'd like to hope we haven't. Mm. It's the first time we've ever gone backwards as a species. Mm. I can't think of any other occasion where man has not moved forward. But now we've gone back to 1968 in flying terms. Yeah. And he's right. With the end of Concorde, we have taken a step back. But I hope not for long. The engineers who built Concorde showed how to do it. The hard work's been done. Perhaps in 20 years, I'll finally get my supersonic trip with Joan Collins and I'm confident she'll look just as good as ever. Well, I still think Concorde is a stunning machine, a beautiful piece of engineering and design. Sadly, if you want to fly supersonically nowadays, 
You have to be in the RAF and under 24. Damn, just missed it. Our aeronautical boffins have picked five planes which are arguably the cream of British aviation engineering. But which is the cream of the cream? The Spitfire, the incredibly agile fighter plane that stuck it to the Bosch. Sir Frank Whittle's Gloucester Meteor, which launched the Jet A. Or the Comet, the first ever passenger jet plane. Then there's the Harrier Jump Jet, the most versatile boy's own jet fighter in the world. Or perhaps Concorde, the supersonic superstar, arguably the most elegant plane ever built. But how can you compare a Spitfire to a Harrier or a Comet to Concorde? Which best epitomizes Britain's aero design and engineering skills? War is very good for engineering, isn't it? It is. How it inspires people to, you know, create new things and push boundaries. And the Second World War saw the Spitfire technology. What a great play. I mean it was lovely seeing the Spitfire because it it look it looks like a Spitfire. That the, the sound and the shape. I know it sounds fascist to say so when you see it, you think, oh it's a Spitfire. Unmistakable. When girls are younger, they go and go. Oh like yeah. Do, well, know. perhaps it was just me pretending to be a Spitfire yeah. pilot. But I mean, they are incredible machines. Simple and well engineered. Unmistakable, like Concorde. Concorde. What a nose. Not a Concorde. Not the Concorde, but Concorde. Concorde. You just know what it is. Lovely plane. That. Beautiful. Incredibly noisy. Mm. Only twice, isn't it? It's only twice noisy isn't it, per journey, I think. <laughs> um, the Gloucester Meteor which mm -hmm. I actually went up and that was a great privilege. Did you enjoy that? It was a bit hairy, I have to say. <laughs> the Comet, which is actually well spoken of by anyone involved in aeronautics, but of course had a tragic history. Yeah, but the... Beautiful the, plane. Beautiful plane. What I like the Hawker Harry, I think that's got to be my favourite because it's such a, a British thing. What we need is an aircraft that can take off in a very short runway. Rory, I will never forget the sight of you as a human jump jet oh, yeah. in that wind tunnel. With my face wobbling. <laughs> <laughs> but what about the guys who are the test pilots? You know, they're getting this machine for the first, an untested, untried machine. Incredible you know, confidence in your team. Flying it vertically, flying at the speed of sound, flying it upside down. So never mind about them. What about the stewardesses? I know, drinks everywhere. <laughs> Coffee everywhere. Could you do it? I'm going to have to say goodbye there. Okay. Bye. Goodbye.